from the creators who brought you RuPaul's Drag Race and Million Dollar Listing. This is World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of the Wow Report, where we count down the top 10 things that made us go wow this <laughs> that made us go wow, wow. past week. I'm Fenton Bailey, co-founder of World of Wonder, joined as usual, but it's no less special for that, by Jane St. James, editor of The Wow Report. Hello, Fenton. Hello, Blake. Hello, James. Ah, yes, and Blake, standing in for Tom, who is away on assignment, which actually is code word for vacation. <laughs> Hello. Um, hi Blake, how are you doing? I'm fabulous These are the dog days of August Everybody's away Except the three of us, right? Uh, let's start counting down Let's start at number 10 Number 10 that's me. I watched A Woman of Affairs on Turner Classic Movie as part of their uh, ma marathon of Garbo films. And this is a 1928 silence. And I've seen most of Garbo's. I've seen all of her talkies. I haven't seen all of the silence. And I am a huge Garbo fan. I just I find her fascinating beyond fascinating. Um, but this one was different. I was fascinated because one of the characters, it was Douglas Fairbanks Jr. in one of his first roles, okay? And Douglas Fairbanks Jr. is just gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous to look at. And he plays Garbo's brother, Jerry. And Jerry is this decadent playboy who always has a cocktail in his hand, and he's always wearing these really spiffy tuxedos. And he's got this one lock of hair that falls in front of his face, and he's pushing it back, pushing it back, pushing it back. And he... um. It's a silent movie, so everyone's wearing lots of makeup. But Jerry is wearing more makeup than usual. He's got like eyeshadow on and eye, you know, big fake false eyelashes. And he's got this best friend Johnny, and Johnny's just really swell. He's just the swellest friend a boy could have. And Joey, Johnny's on the rowing team at Cambridge, and he's always wearing these little short shorts and little muscle tees. And Jerry's always watching him row. And you're just the best rower. I just think you're just you're just swell, Johnny. Right? Well, now. <laughs> Uh, spoiler alert, Johnny commits suicide, and that's just the end for Jerry. And Jerry locks himself in a hotel room and proceeds to drink himself to death. That's the second spoiler. And <laughs> interestingly, this is like one, obviously, Jerry is gay, right? And Jerry is one of probably one of the first gay characters in movies. You know, this is 1928, and he's a main character, and He's a, a flamboyant gay. He's a very obviously affected flamboyant gay, but he is not a, a figure of fun. He is not. They do not make fun of him, and he's not like condescendingly. They don't treat him condescendingly, even though he is, you know, one of the, a tragic gay who dies, you know, tragically. But he's, but he's treated very seriously as a character, and he's treated with love and respect. And it's fascinating to see that in 1928 and to see a flamboyant gay portrayed on screen, you know? But I think, James, in 1928, there wasn't this sort of opprobrium. This was sort of pre the Hayes Code, right? This yes, was the exactly. Wall Street crash or around the same time as the Wall Street crash. And so there was actually an extraordinary moment of sort of gay acceptance and swishy acceptance. So. Uh, not just, by the way, in the U.S. and in the movies, but also in Germany. Germany was on yeah, the very oh, forefront sure. of homosexual studies and Magnus Hirschfeld. And then it all came crashing down. And, and I think in the, you're right. In the, in the 30s, there was a new homophobia. That, that broke in, but in the 20s, that wasn't there. And it's it. There's also a scene because this is pre haze code where Garbo is lying in bed and it's her wedding night and she's married this man that she doesn't love. She's married Johnny, in fact, that, that she doesn't love. And she's waiting in bed for him for him to come take her virginity. And there's a light hanging overhead that goes on and off, on and off. That she pulls a chain, and you see on her face that she is bored and horny 
as fuck and that she's irritated that this man is probably gay and he's not nothing's gonna happen and all this stuff that like is pre hates code that like you just you see on her face that she's just waiting for this guy to come fuck her and she's just like pulling the chain pulling the chain which is sort of like you know code for fuck in and out in and out on and off it's oh. just fascinating to see pre pre haze code movies. Now, when they set the movie up, uh, do they like do they give you any framework when they show it on TCM? Do you or do you just they just throw it on the movie and you have to figure it all out yourself? Um, well, for a lot of the Garbo movies, there was someone coming on beforehand and talking about it. I think someone was talking about the famous scene where she's pulling the coat, pulling the chain, and you because it's it's MGM and the lighting is so fantastic, it's just flashing on her face, and you see her cheekbones and everything like that. But and they do talk a little bit about that. They didn't talk about the gay thing. I had to mm. fit, suss that out for myself. Well, but he's very obviously gay, so. It, Same as it ever was, about. right? I mean, still is kind of a closet. Like they still, you know, here's this film, and they're not yeah. talking about what it's about. Um yeah. hey, spoiler alert number three. Did does she get fucked? Like Oh, she well, she ends up being the, the, a woman of affairs. She ends up sleeping with the entire all of London, all of France, all of Germany. She's a big whore by the because after her husband commits suicide, she um uh, just goes berserk and just fucks everything that the the, the walks on two legs and she's she's hated for it she becomes you know she's all everyone she's a woman cast out of society because she's such a big whore Hmm. i love it that is a woman of affairs on uh, tcm turner classic movies right yeah Yeah. i find it i'm i it sounds like i'm scolding i promise i'm not but it's like in a tsunami of content that's coming out every day you and Tom can always be relied on to have watched an old movie. Like, <laughs> I, know. I I felt like I was doing Tom's role. I, I was doing I was doing a Tom today. <laughs> All right, uh, number nine, Blake. Are you going to do a James St. James? Number nine. Well, now I'm I'm here with the newsworthy, you know, points to ponder, uh, and this is in the ongoing Britney Spears saga. I don't know if you guys saw last week that she had tweeted something about how or tweeted or twatted or Instagrammed about how her kids were hateful. Well, <laughs> then. Well, how old said, are her kids now? How old are they? I think they're like 12 or 13 or maybe they're older. In that teenage. They, oh, they yes, are okay. in a phase yeah. in which children all around the world are generally recognized to become hateful. So yeah. just as a piece of Not content. Even, no one is the exception, though. Oh, <laughs> of course, how dare you even suggest? <laughs> I think they're older than 12 or 13. I think they're like 15, 16 now. There I you go. Yes. Yeah. So KFED in, uh, like, released these videos that he said that him and the kids got together and decided to release these to the world of Britney yelling at her kids. Oh, no. And when they someone one of my friends you know messaged me and was like oh my god can you believe this so i watched them and in the first one she's like yelling about them being disrespectful and that they should respect women and something about putting lotion on their coarse skin or something okay really random so i was like okay maybe you know there's something big in the next video well the next video ironically is Brittany yelling at Jaden, who's the younger one, for not wearing his shoes inside, like, a store. Well, yeah. Don't you think that's a little ironic, though, since Brittany was always photographed, like, walking through gas Gas stations stations with her? her Yes, but, like, let's be fair, because, like, Brittany, that was during, let's call them the troubles, you know, and she wasn't, like, she was having, she was facing challenges and having problems, and I think, She's right. And also, oh. don't you want your kids to do better than you? Yeah. Don't you, right. you I was learn say, from your mistakes? Yes. She's a mother now, so she, you know, but she's yelling at him and she had taken his phone away because I guess, you know, that was the punishment. And more the whole thing Seems boils fine. down to I just don't, right? I don't just... see what she did wrong. Yeah. Like no. it sounds like she was just being a good mom to me. It's how and maybe, every mother loses it at some point on their kids if their kids are being brats or do, doing fucking up. Yeah, no, I have no problem with Brittany yelling at her kids. I mean, my mom I, was one of the best mothers of all time, but there are some moments in time that if they were recorded, 
you know, may, it may have looked differently for her. You but. have missed your chance, Blake, to be the <laughs> most victimized child in America <laughs> by not having those moments on tape. I agree. Well, My listen. dad always used to say when he was teaching me to drive, he's like, do as I say, not as I do. And exactly. he never did what he said to do. He was, you know, not a hypocrite. But he was well, this, this like... might be sort of a downer <laughs> contribution to the to the conversation. But on my mother's deathbed, my sister and I were arguing about something. And one of her last words were, oh, hush, you do. Stop it. <laughs> and that we, we laugh about that all the time because my mother must have said that to us 100,000 times when we were growing up. Oh, hush, you two, Just stop it. And that was right. one of the last thing she said. So... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, that's what mothers do. I'm team Brittany on this one. I don't no. think she really did anything wrong. And I think no. that the kids, if anything, have been like groomed to think that she's the enemy or. Yes. And and to have your kids put that out on, on you know, YouTube or whatever on social media. What what, what horrible little brats that is. Well, it your only just proves that they cool. are hateful little shit. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right, then. Way to go, Brittany. Brittany. All yeah. right. Okay. Uh, another number eight. Let's move on. Number eight. I watched. There's a sort of theme to this, I suppose. Woman of Affairs and Britney. So let's talk about Diana Spencer. I think it's coming up on the 25th anniversary of her death uh, in that car crash in France. So, of course, there's a documentary because we haven't seen any documentaries about oh. Princess Diana before. <laughs> it's what called this. It's called The Princess. And the uh, USP, the unique selling point of this documentary is that it is only archive footage. There is no commentator, there are no mm -hmm. interviews, it's all archive, archive, archive. Oh, that's As interesting. if to say, well, yes, of course, it does sound interesting because in a way you think, oh, I'm gonna get the truth, I'm gonna get the story and I can judge for myself. Yeah. No, not a bit of it. Here's the problem, you know, Princess, I was going to say Princess Diana was the most filmed princess, but that's kind of silly because every princess will be the most filmed, you know, the most lensed for her time. Let's say that, right? So the point is, you can take all that footage and you can tell any story you want oh, to with that yeah. footage. Mm -hmm. Now, the story that this film chooses to tell is a story of poor little shy Diana evil prince charles well as if we haven't a... seen this narrative a hundred thousand times and exactly. i don't believe it for a second exactly nothing new and i frankly think an amazing opportunity to use archive to really shed light on a story in a new light completely blunt it just tells the same old story we've heard a million times that the royal family is awful, stony-faced, incapable of anything. Diana was a shy princess who suddenly blossomed when the public, the royal family got jealous, they were unhappy. Blah, fucking blah. I was I so really, angry. No, I, yeah, I, I honestly like, think that Diana was a little more manipulative, a lot more manipulative than, we, than they give her credit for. And I think that probably Charles and Camilla were destined to be together. And that, that I think that they're yeah, the, the... I think the, that's, the, that's the, exactly. One. I think the opportunity to tell a contrarian narrative, not just for the sake of telling a contrarian narrative, but to add to the reality, which is... People are complicated. You yes. may be a princess, you may be a prince, you're still a real person. And as such, you're still a complicated person. And I was, I was just in, and of course, then, you know, you read the reviews, the sanctimonious reviews, oh, the media killed Diana. You know, the usual, again, the usual thing of the media was the evil monster, you know, driving her to her grave. I was, I was just in a rage. I tell you something, I was, in the UK when she died. Actually, I was in France when she died in the crash, and then I was in the UK in the days afterwards. I was nowhere near the crash. I didn't kill Diane. <laughs> but <laughs> one of the most amazing experiences that I will remember for the rest of my life was going to St. James's Park after dark in the early fall days of September. There was a light mist and drizzle, and there were crowds everywhere, all through the park, bringing roses and flowers. And it was the most haunting, beautiful, and completely silent scene. Now, there were cameras. Is there any of that in this? No. 
It's just that same old shot we've seen a million times of the royal family emerging in, their, uh, in Balmoral after a few days and looking at the, we've seen it all before. And I can't believe in this world in which there's so much archive of her that they couldn't have told a different story and that they couldn't yeah. have found something we haven't seen before. You know, I am sick of a freaking montage where you see some silly person in a Union Jack hat and that means that, oh, everyone was crazy about Princess Diana and loved her. No, no, they didn't. People, people knew that she was a little bit complicated. You know? Especially after she that wild-eyed interview that she did with Martin Bashir, remember where she was, right. you know, and and I think a lot of people turned on her then. I think I don't think that she was the the people's princess. And when she was having the affair with Dodie, I think there was a lot of you know people right. were angry about that. They didn't like Dodie Fayed and her. It's especially galling. There's a moment where anyone who suggests that this film is not manipulative, there's a moment where they show Princess Diana's baby sucking on its finger. And then they cut to the royal family on a on a hunt shooting birds out of the sky. So you go close up from the baby sucking on his finger to close up of a pheasant, you know, fluttering its wings as it crashes to earth. I mean, so manipulative. Yeah. You know, so that's uh, the princess. And where can you uh, find it? Streaming on Peacock. Oh, OK. Mm. Is it streaming on Peacock? Yeah, they have a stream. Oh, is that is where it you watched it? No, I don't know where I watched it. I watched it. Well, but... because I saw online that it said it was on Peacock, like whenever I Googled right. it, but then I looked on Peacock and couldn't find it. Oh, so well, maybe it's on it's HBO on... Max. I think it's on HBO Max. The Princess, streaming on HBO Max. <laughs> and if you can't find it on HBO Max, look on Peacock. <laughs> it may or may not be that. Anyway, regardless, I don't recommend it. I think it's kind of totally old rubbish. <laughs> Let's take a break, Blake. Um, okay, well, what did people used to say instead of cheese when having their pictures taken? Hmm. That's an interesting question. All right, we'll be right back with the WOW Report after this break. You're listening to World of Wonders WOW Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the WOW Report. I just want to tell you we have a new show. World of Wonder has a new show airing on um, Food Network. On Discovery Plus, and it's called. I love this title so much. It's called. It's complicated, James. Cool. You get it. It's, it's not complicated. It's complicated. It's about fussy eaters, picky eaters. And oh, <laughs> I think it's such a great title. It is. That's very good. Inside yeah. story: The network didn't want the title, and we were like, "Are you crazy?" And they were like, "Oh, it's too hard to say. It's like people won't get it." But well, you got it. I did, I did, I did, I did. It's hysterical. <laughs> That's and he's so a simpleton. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's Hope complicated. It, it's complicated. It's my new favorite saying. I, I can't stop saying it. it's hosted by social media vegan icon Tabitha Brown, and it's on Thursdays. All right, so you had a question for us, Blake. Yes, yeah. um, and it's food related. What did people used to say instead of cheese when having their picture taken? I know. Sauerkraut. Fromage. <laughs> no, when, when people of the Victorian era sat down for a photo, they avoided cheesy grins and maintained a more dignified expression by saying prunes. Prunes. Oh, because it, it gives you it gives you duck lips. Prunes. prunes. I think Paris Hilton still says prunes. I think I she think it was I think it was the Olsen twins I've heard. The Olsen twins, yes. Prune. I love that. Prunes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're counting down the top 10 things that made us go, wow, I'm Fenton here with James and Blake in for Tom Campbell, who's on um, vacay. So we've reached number seven. Number seven. Number seven. I am reading a book, a 1959 memoir that was re-released in 2020 called Double Exposure, A Twins Autobiography. And it is the story of the dazzling Morgan twins who are society darlings of the 1920s and 30s. And the one Like sister, Morgan Stanley, maybe? No, this is actually... Well, um, 
okay, the, the one the one twin is Gloria and Gloria Morgan. Gloria marries Reginald Vanderbilt and becomes big Gloria Vanderbilt, mother of little Gloria Vanderbilt, who had one of the biggest custody battles of the 1930s of all time, basically. And um, the other sister is Thelma, Thelma Furness, who marries the Vicomte Furness in uh, Marmaduke, the, the Vicomte of Furness. And she is part of the Belvedere set in the 1930s, which was surrounded Prince, the Prince of Wales. And she was the mistress of the Prince of Wales. And she very famously said to her best friend, Wallace Simpson, she had to go out of town for six months. And she said, would you look after the little man? Will you look after him and make sure that he's entertained? And when she came back after six months, by God, she had kept it. Wallace Simpson and had kept the prince entertained. And Thelma was kicked to the curb. And the oh. king... The, the prince married Wallace Simpson. And when he became king, of course, the British public would not let him marry the twice divorced American. And so he gave up his throne for Wallace Simpson. So these two women have a front seat to history, right? They are right there for some of the biggest stories of the 20th century. And yet they are such shallow, silly little debutante nothings that, and they're telling the story in the second. You know, they're telling in the we, we did this, we did that, we went here and we went there. They're both telling the story at the same time. So it's an interesting idea for a book that it's like in the royal as the we, uh, but they don't have any insight into their place in history. They have no, in, it's all basically, we, we were wearing this gray taffeta gown and these wonderful jewels and she was had her hair up and we went to the palace and we did this. And it's so silly and but it's fascinating, and it's, it is sort of uh, – so I'm thoroughly enjoying it. It's called Double Exposure, a twin biography by the Morgan twins, Gloria and Thelma. Oh, and also, um, you know, little Gloria is uh, Anderson Cooper's mother. So this is Anderson Cooper's oh. grandmother who is, tell, is telling who have you Who you have just called shallow. Yes, I did. <laughs> I don't think Anderson would like her very much either. <laughs> it, it's probably a bit like us. Here we are at this radical moment in history, and we're talking about, you know, <laughs> Garbo movies on Turner Classic Movies. And when we should be discussing, yes, the committee, the January 6th committee. Right, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a hot read. Um, Blake, number six, have you got something hot for us? Number six. I do. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what I've been streaming. Yeah. Um, have you streaming. guys seen Prey? I have seen Prey. Did you like it? I hated it. I thought it was complete rubbish. I, I thought nothing happened for the first 40 or 50 minutes. I thought it was a superficial, silly narrative. I was like, I'm in a... I'm in a Wait, what is Prey? First of all, wait a minute. You're... T you're why are... Fenton, you just enraged me. You're watching something called Prey, but, but you won't listen to any of my suggestions ever, ever, ever. But tell me what is Prey. What is Prey? Well, Prey is the fifth in the Predator franchise. And it was released straight to Hulu, and it's been getting like great world word of mouth. Everyone is watching it. It's got ninety three percent on Rotten Tomatoes. It's about this young uh, Comanche girl. It's set in the seventeen hundreds in Pennsylvania, and she wants to be a hunter like her brother and all the other guys. But you know, it's the 1700s, so they don't want her to be a hunter. And she goes out and hunts, and you know, refines her skills. And while she's out there, she starts seeing these strange things. And spoiler alert: it's a predator from you know from outer space. I kind of enjoyed it just to have something to watch, but. The, the story is a little like, eh, like. But I sort of like the idea of you taking like the alien from aliens and popping it in feudal Japan. Or like, you know, the idea yeah. of like taking some sort of monster and, and putting it in the past. I like that idea. But that, I like that too. And and like the, the whole predator concept is, isn't it? That the, wherever the predator planet is, that they basically drop their, their young into these onto these other planets to find the strongest person that they the strongest thing that they then hunt and must kill as a sort of rite of passage right it's a so it's a sort of yeah and it, needless to say she wants to be a hunter and her tribe won't let her 
and yet she's the one who's figured out there is a predator among them. Of course, nope. they don't believe her. You know, it kind of like, and then, oh, and maybe we, then you have the Brits who are coming in, slaughtering all the buffalo as a sort of little distraction, and not, probably the only thing worse than a predator. Wait, but are the this Brits. all sounds like you enjoyed it. Why did you hate it, Benton? I, I actually felt all these premise points were just better than the story that was delivered. Mm -hmm. I just, okay. thought, you know, the special effects were great. Well, listen, I mean, might I suggest that you watch something called The Boys and come back and tell us what you think? I about did it. watch an episode of The Boys, James, and I'm still kind of in shock and i just wait did you watch I, the first episode i watched the first episode of season two oh. um and so i kind of need to start at the beginning though don't you i suppose i should but i i really was going to try to get to the the superhero guys i mean i thought james would be really cross with me if i just watched that episode so i thought well let me start with season two and i'll begin and try and pick it up as i go along so i have more work to do before i can i but i do think that if you watch the first episode it sets everything up the whole idea of right. superheroes as commodities and soup i know, will the watch it over I more you will yeah, i will okay. Okay. Anyway, sorry, and, I, I distracted actually, you. From this you're not dis I, I do have a question for you because you, you sent around a picture, or Blake, I think you sent a, of giant piles of white powder and then some weird sort of orifice oh. in the background on some kind of green screen set. Yeah, what? yeah. Well, that was the boys, and it was the episode I told you where he oh. goes in the pee hole. He did, and they do a bunch of cocaine, and then he, the hero shrinks down to micro, and he goes in the pee hole of the of the oh. penis and is banging around on the sides, and it gives the guy an orgasm. I just. I, but, but it was nice to see that it wasn't I, CGI, that they actually made a giant pee hole for this guy to crawl into. I said, it's just, I have found in life that sometimes when you talk about things, James, they sound so amazing. And then I oh, experience no. them. And there's a like, it's like a serving a suggestion. On, you know, I, I cook the food and it doesn't look like it does on the back end. <laughs> So in some ways, I've been reluctant to get dismayed, but now I'm really terrified that everything you say about the superheroes may be true. Um, yeah, it is true. How dare you question me? <laughs> so, I, I mean, I'd say give Prey a shot. All right. I'm, you know, but I'm not into the Predator franchise. Do I have to be into the Predator franchise to like this? No, no. it's a standalone. Oh, I, I will say the one thing I really hated. You said the graphics were great, Benton. I hated how much the predator looked like a human from like the neck down. Mm. It just took it out from me. Like it should have had like some weird legs or something. Mm. Anyway. Uh, yeah, Are you a fan of the predator movies though, Blake? I have seen a few. I know, you know, that's not normally my, my thing, but yeah, I kind of like them. Okay. It is an interesting franchise and I, I feel it hasn't quite delivered the way it, should or could do you know i, I feel so the, the best predator one movie one schwarzenegger right was is is he in it yeah yeah okay. the original okay. one yeah mm -hmm. um all right let's move on um number five number five rest in perfection and H. Oh, god right, this is one of the saddest stories um yeah. and i sort of feel a little bit you know i, I sort of don't feel that she's really been mourned or paid tribute to um and what a complicated interesting fascinating just uh character she was and she mm. was just i don't think she ever got her due in life exactly. for what for what a, a really complicated woman and a great actress she really was a main in her in her role she was fantastic and you you knew her a bit, i knew right? her yeah i can't yeah. say i knew her well but we made a film years ago called The Real Ellen Story, which was made with Ellen DeGeneres and Anne Heche about their, their relationship and everything that they experienced going public about that relationship. Because as you probably remember in the, in the 90s, it wasn't so much that when Ellen came out and said she was gay that people were shocked. It was that she wanted her character in her sitcom, Ellen, yeah. to be gay. And Disney said, no way. And at the time, she had just met and fell in love with Anne. And I, absolutely no criticism of Alan. I know that all the attention and the media was focused on, on Alan. But Anne was a key player in that story. And I do believe, again, not Alan's fault, but I do believe Anne sacrificed a great deal. Yeah, and I, I, th I don't think that she ever recovered her career she after that in a way that Alan most certainly did. 
Ellen did. I mean, uh, there was a point where it wasn't sure that either of them would be able to recover their careers. Mm -hmm. In the event, we saw that 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 hey, shush. We saw that that's Dorothy kicking off barking. Can you hear it? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, okay. So in the end, yes, Ellen stood to lose her entire career, but then had a huge success with her daytime talk show. Um, and not so much. And as James says, she was an amazing actress and so beautiful yeah. and sort of and dazzling in a way that mm. I, I think that um in a way that a lot of bipolar people can be yes oh there, there there is something of dazzling about those manic highs that everyone just wants to be a part of and just it's it's just interesting to watch it's just I think, i'm getting goosebumps from you saying this because that was exactly it she had yeah. a radiant elfin she was like a sprite she had yeah. this amazing magical energy yeah. and she was just lovely i mean just lovely but then, and but then the low the lows are you know the highs are our mountain high val in the lows are valley low and she was a victim of of those lows and i think that's what people labeled her because of yeah the barefoot in the in the <sighs> desert yeah. and the ufos and what uh -huh, have you uh -huh. i think it's a shame though that because of that and i suppose that was partly not unconnected with her dad and yeah. because of that it seems people are reluctant to pay tribute there's a certain sense of like okay let's and, move on and i just think that's so sad because she was yeah. this incredible being she was asked not long before she died who she wanted to play her in a biopic, which we know there will surely be at one point. And she said, uh, Miley Cyrus. Or I, that. Yeah. And, I mean, genius casting, you know, yeah. and I, I feel that Miley Cyrus, I mean, Anne said this, you know, from Hannah Montana to do that and then to be able to do Wrecking Ball, that shows incredible range, the way she moves, the way she sings, her voice, her compassion, she fucking loves everyone. And I thought that was a, a beautiful thing to say about Miley and so true of of her energy that I think was energy shared by Anne. And I think it's such a sad loss. And it's the, the way she died is just so horrific and so unimaginable what she went through in her last moments. And just, mm. uh, it's, it's just such a sad, sad story. And I just, God bless Anne Hayes. And I, mm. I, I wish that there's a, would be a, a big review of, of her body of work and, and who she was. Yeah. yeah. And that biopic, because I think yeah. for her to be in that relationship with Ellen, that relationship changed so much for so many of us, I think, mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. terms, in a way, gayness was perceived and received, not just in Hollywood, but culturally. And it really kind of normalized it. Exactly. Exactly. And you, that's why you needed, it wasn't enough that Ellen just said, I'm gay it was a demonstration of a relationship and to be able to see a relationship and two people in love, you know, going and you to you don't want the narrative to be what the, like the princess Diana thing we were just talking about. We don't want people to turn her into a tragic, uh, you know, Marilyn Monroe type or whatever, because she's more than the tragedy of, of, of that, you know, and she, she, she you want something that's sort of the totality of who she was. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, let's take a break. Blake. Ah, I do have one other question. It's pretty silly, though. <laughs> what is the closest living relative to the Tyrannosaurus Rex? Okay, we've got uh, uh, what is that? Anthropological? No, that's the wrong word. What kind of a question is that? Just Biological? a silly one. No. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we'll have the answer right after the break here on the Wow Report with Radio Andy. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report. Fenton here with James and Blake sitting in for Tom. I think I might know the answer to this question. I think I know the answer too. What is it, Blake? What is the question? What is the closest living relative to the T Rex? Well, I it's it's some sort of bird, isn't it? It's like a is it a like a blue jay or something? Is it a specific bird or is it just a bird? It's a specific. I think it's a chicken. That's oh. right. 
Yes. Oh, wow. It makes you realize Tyrannosaurus Rexes must have been delicious. <laughs> He's it, like, yeah, this, yeah. this says for the first time, researchers have sequenced proteins from the long extinct creature, the T Rex, and many of the molecules show a remarkable similarity to those of the chicken. Well, and I will just add to this one of the most fascinating things I discovered or learned recently. <laughs> I didn't discover it, least, but you know, is that um, it was a virus that supposedly changed us from being egg layers to carrying babies in our tummies. Really? Yeah. That we every were animal once? used to, the, every, the way they would reproduce was to lay eggs. And that it was a virus that tweaked that so that you carry the, the, carry the egg, as it were, like fetus inside. I feel like, um, Fenton, you have laid a few eggs. In the day. <laughs> <laughs> but the ones I'm carrying inside, oh my God. <laughs> we are counting down the top 10 things that made us go, wow, this week we've reached number four. Number four. Number four, do spiders dream? Um, there was a recent article in Scientific American that suggests that they do. A behavioral ecologist, Danielle Robler, uh, caught some jumping spiders and kept them in a plastic box to study them. And one night she came home and she noticed that they were all um, motionless and dangling upside down from their webs and not moving. And she thought that they were dead at first, but she just she noticed that one of them twitched. And so she got some, a bunch of um, night vision cameras and duct tape magnifying glasses to them so that she could study them 24 hours. And she aimed them at, at the jumping spiders. And then um, she realized that they weren't just hanging, they were twitching, which suggested to her that they were in REM sleep. And that once she re got, got to that, she realized, well, that of course spiders dream. They have such colorful, they, they see hundreds of colors that we do not. They have this um, rich sensory world that they live in and that they have these amazing cognitive abilities and memories. So of course they sleep and it just opens up this whole idea of insects being able to dream that nobody had ever really thought of before. And it's just a fascinating article. It's just, this is a very quick, uh, quick thing that I'm just mentioning. We Thank have you. to. Will you post a link to the article on the Yes, yes definitely. Because yeah, I would be like, what do they dream about? You know. Well, like I said, you know, they see more colors than we do. They they, they have 27 eyes or 100 eyes or whatever like that, and they have this amazing cognitive abilities and memories to make their webs and things like that. So I imagine they're dreaming about colors and webs and web design and and things like that. I think it's just it's it is interesting to think of of a little spider in my bathroom having this wonderful dream life. It might I'll be a wait. nightmare. And I'll then you walk in in the morning. And then you walk in in the morning naked. I'm, I'm naked. <laughs> and they're, they're having nightmares about the 27 of eyes that they see, James. <laughs> oh, I always man. wonder what the dog, my dog is dreaming about. You know, the well, that's, yeah, and dogs like, and cats, we know they dream and they're always like chasing after birds and things. Yeah. Let's move on. Number three. Number three. It's me again. Yes, I have very sad news that after um uh 57 years on NBC since 1965, Days of Our Lives is no longer on network television. And then there were three soap operas left. It um it isn't going away for good. It is moving to the Peacock Network where it will be streaming. And they've had um, Peacock has had really great success with these Beyond Salem miniseries that they've been doing, these five episode arcs based on characters from Days of Our Lives. So I think that was the idea was that they were going to move it to streaming. And I don't know if this will work. Um, uh, it's sad that it's behind a paywall now. If you want to see a soap, the soap opera of, that you've been watching with, with your grandmother, um, uh, I know in 2011, when uh, All My Children and One Life to Live were canceled, they tried to go to web series and they tried doing YouTube, but they couldn't sustain it. It cost too much with the production and the actor salaries that it wasn't able to sustain itself on as a web series. So I don't know if you can sustain something on, on streaming or not. We shall have to see. But I've watched 
days of our lives since 1984, 85. So this is sort of, I do get Peacock in it, but it's just, it's a whole different world out there for soap operas. And it's just mm. sort of sad. I can't believe that it was 2011 that all my children. And is that crazy? I know it's been over 10 years since it, they were on the air. And it gives me a little hope that days of our lives will do better just because I mean, web series in 2011 and streaming series in 2022. It's, it is. It's like apples and oranges. Yeah. Different. Yeah. But the only thing I do worry about is like, a, I feel like a lot of older people watch yeah, soap that's operas. Just it. The, the people who watch soap gonna... operas are not going to want to pay $4. You know, your 75 year old grandmother who's been watching since 1965 isn't going to want to pay $4.95 a month. To, to continue watching it. So I think they're going to lose their core audience, their core demographics, right. little old queens like myself. Well, it's funny also, just sort of stepping back a bit, is that I know streaming's taking over everything, but also linear TV is having a bit of a revival. And oh. that, that a lot of, also a lot of streaming networks are now offering what are called fast channels, which are basically linear they like linear TV channels with oh, is, is, is watching it live. Yes. Yeah. yeah so you're watching, uh, uh, you know, depending on the time of day you watch, that's what's streaming. Yeah. It's well, they like, like live Hulu. There's a, there is live Hulu, yeah. I think, yeah, which is, yeah. The, and so, I watch on Discovery Plus, they have channels like they have the, the Deadly Women channel or the Chopped and Flipped channel. Where that's, they just that's, the that's, those are fast channels. That's what they are. And, um, have you watched House of Hammer yet, Blake? No. Has it started? I don't think so. What is House, House of House of Hammer is a multi-part series about Army ha Army Hammer and his family oh. and his cannibalism and what. No, have I haven't you. watched. Uh, uh. I'm, I will watch that though. All right, number number two. Number two. I. <laughs> I had a dining experience in LA recently that was like nothing else in the sense that it was sort of a parody of all things LA. The first, it all begins, the, the, the restaurant is called um, Meteora. Like uh, if you want to call it Meteor, call it Meteor, but it has to call it Meteora. And you walk up the steps and that's where it all begins because you can't actually find the entrance. There's this sort of giant bird's nest on the wall of twigs and you're like stumbling around trying like, how does this open? And the whole thing swings open when you press in the right place and you go into this space inside and there's a hole in the roof. I mean, it's like, it's so LA. It's like, you know, it's like in, in, in that moment in Wall Street when there's a coffee table without any glass on it and someone puts that, you know, remember that moment in Wall Street? Sylvia Miles, someone puts that hey! of water on the coffee table and it's just a hole in the middle of the coffee table. <laughs> it's sort of like that. So, okay. So then, so you're in there and the first thing that happens, you sit down and someone in linens approaches you and all the waiters are in linens and they're sort of, they look like they're in a cult and they sort of whisper and they, they, they bring up this thing and they say, our libation this evening is blah, 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 blah. And they pour you a little liquid of a libation and I don't know. It's not alcohol necessarily. It's I, who knows. It's like twigs and bark and moss, sort of distilled. And then they bring the menus, and the menus are in a sort of binder that's like pressed. Twi it's all very twigs and mosses. And, and what, but what is the relationship between the twigs and the meteor? I don't quite understand. I don't know. I, I will read to you what the what the menu says though. Beginning with the rhythms of nature. Oh, <laughs> Uh, cuisine <laughs> emphasizes. Oh my God! Right there, you just lost me. I would have walked out. <laughs> emphasizes the healing energy of ingredients. Oh God! Utilizing prime ordeal cooking methods. Oh no! We seek to generate new flavors of past experience. Oh God! United by our modern time, we seek ingredients only from sources of exceptional biodiversity. Um, we eschew traditional cocktail methodology, which means... Oh, my God. <laughs> we eschew cocktail methodology? <laughs> Just give me a drink! And <laughs> right? Make it a, you know, rum and coke, quick. A double. <laughs> How about this? Uh, I ordered, for a starter, leaves and stones. Oh, for fuck's sake. 
heirloom and experimental varieties of stone fruit awakened over the fire, served with crispy, crispy brassica leaves on a piece of grilled roses, quark, and cured duck breast. Now, were you just hysterical laughing the whole time? Well, at first we were a little intimidated. So Billy, Nolan, and I went, at first we were a little intimidated. And then (laughs) gradually, as we looked at each other, we were like, oh my God, we're in, we're in some sort of LA simulation. Yes. Um, oh, and, and then the rest else, of no, it's, it's actually it was, like a Woody Allen movie. It really is. Like it's, it was, it's, it was. And we were sitting there waiting for our food to arrive. And we saw a waiter, all the waiters move, I think clockwise around the room. Only <laughs> clockwise. And at some point we saw something coming towards us with a bowl that was sort of smoking. And we thought, oh my God, our first food has arrived. It was like, shh. And she just walked straight past us because she was sort of smudging the space, burning sage. Oh, and so every so often there'd be a procession of someone bearing a bowl, burning sage. It is, it's like that scene in Annie Hall where they go to, to it, L.A. and they're like they're passing around the, the lines of cocaine and he sneezes, you know, the, yeah. The very, yeah. And they're it just making fun of everyone. Yes. Oh, it, my God. And for a final shot, a cup of coffee at the end of your meal, $30. Thirty dollars. Need to say it's beans that have been eaten and pooed by an owl. You know all that. Oh, animal. I've heard of that animal. So that is Chef Jordan Khan's new restaurant. It's called Meteora. It's just opened. It's on Melrose, Melrose and Highland, pretty much. Um, okay. So go at your own risk and uh, be prepared for some sticker shock. I tell you. <laughs> I was going to say, I, th- to to be something so pretentious, it's got to cost like two thousand dollars. <laughs> the price of a mortgage just to eat that. Yes, that's hysterical. <laughs> Drag Race Philippines premiering on Wednesday, and the first international untucked to coincide. Um, that's Drag Race Philippines today available worldwide. Wow presents plus. And remember, if you're not subscribed, you're not watching all of Drag Race. So we're going to take one more break. And when we come back, reveal the number one thing this week that made us go wow. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report. I'm Fenton here with James and Blake standing in for Tom. We've been counting down the top 10 things that make us go wow. And we've reached number one. Number one. Um, number one, I think, you know, we need to talk. It's, it's, you know, we need to talk about Kevin. We need to talk about Ezra. Uh, Ezra Miller has been in the news a lot lately. It seems every time you open up a web page, they are in some sort of more trouble than they were last time. They were um, uh, recently accused of grooming a teenager. Uh, they were accused of shoplifting some vodka. There was or like some sort of uh, liquor. They they were um you know they they slapped famously slapped a fan in Iceland. They were on a rampage in an airport in Hawaii. They and just, doing uh, doing shallow over and over again at a karaoke bar in Hawaii. Yeah, they they seem like they're they're very troubled. And unfortunately, as we were talking about last week. Um, uh, you know, they have this movie coming out, The Flash, next year, and it, it, DC is making it a tentpole production. They think that it's going to be the best they've ever done, but I think that Ezra is going to sink the production. Uh, but just recently, um, there was a headline just this week that Ezra is going into um, treatment. Treatment, yeah, for um, some mental issues that they acknowledge that they are going, that they're having. And maybe that it's something, maybe DC is pulling in the rain saying, you need you need help, kid. And if we're going to continue working with you, you got to get some treatment. Or maybe maybe they just recognize that their career is on the line and that it's time to to step step their pussy up, you know? Well, I think where- also, you know, not to be moralizing about it, but uh, mental health is a thing, and so yeah. it's great when people feel they're able to get help. And, and so there's no shame to this game. Like I, I think that it's if only more of us could get the help we need for our mental normalize issues. it. Normalize yes, it. but right. by the same token, I think that this has been going on for about two or three years now. And I wish that they had sought help earlier or they had gotten help earlier because there's been a lot of of just nasty gossip and a lot of, mm. you know, hurtful. A lot of people have been hurt 
by their actions. And it's just the whole situation is is very bizarre. And I, I don't know quite what to think. Well, uh, sending best vibes then to Ezra Miller. Um, yeah. Certainly um, the massive mega entity that is Warner Brothers, HBO, CNN, <laughs> what Discovery, what have you. I don't think they can afford to put another movie in the trash can, right? So Right. Well, that's just it. You know, I mean, uh, we, we were talking last week about how Batgirl was trashed a $100 million movie. But I think that they have sunk a billion into Ezra. And I just don't think it's feasible for uh, for them to to trash this whole franchise. Mm. Mm. Well, thanks for tuning into the WOW Report this week on Radio Andy Sirius XM. That's all we have time for. But James, thank you. Thank you for having me. That's a pleasure was all mine. And thank you, Blake. And uh, same time, same place next week. Until then, go out and do something that makes the world go wow. Oh.